Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. A channel called Knowing Better has made a video about gun control. Yay! In the interest of beating this issue into the ground, let's take a look and see what it's about. Hit it! If you've been following my channel for a while, you know that every once in a while I like to put out a video that completely destroys my subscriber count or ruins my like to dislike ratio. Hold up. You're the one who made the you don't see in 4K video that's been infesting my recommended video page for like two weeks? I read the comments and there's a lot of PC gamers who aren't happy you aren't justifying the $10,000 they spent on a gaming rig. But here's a thought. Maybe the fact that your video got recommended to hell is what pissed people off. Maybe. So firstly, I am a political moderate. Look, even Facebook, which knows all of my secrets, labeled me as one. As a result, I've been called both a libtard and a Nazi, sometimes in the same video. The term political moderate evokes images of reasonability and temperance. This, in contrast to other philosophies like conservatism or socialism, which are implied to be non-moderate, unreasonable, extremist, or otherwise lacking in merit. Hello, comrade. Do you have a minute to hear the good news of our lord and savior, Kropotkin? Is he a moderate? No, he's a- Then he's wrong! You can see the problem here. A better term would be useful. Like, say, centrist, but I'll go more into this later. So the next two minutes is him talking about his time in the US Army. Anyways, back to the topic. So where does your right to own a gun come from? The same place your right to own any property comes from. Self-ownership. You use your labor to produce value, which you can trade for goods and services, or even just use your labor to make your own gun. It's called property rights. And the policies that you're proposing, which by the way, strip other people of their fundamental human rights. Fundamental human right? You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. It's self-ownership. A fundamental human right is something that explicitly isn't written, like the right to privacy or the right to have a name. If it's written down as part of a law somewhere, it's not a fundamental human right. Just because it's written down doesn't void anyone's right to own particular types of property. I have a right to free speech because I have self-ownership. Because that would mean without the First Amendment, I am not justified in saying anything ever. Do you understand the words coming out of your mouth? Even the right to not be owned by another person had to be written down. That's how vague and abstract fundamental human rights are. The state was the primary sponsor of slavery in America. In fact, the only reason slavery existed at all was because status courts argued that it was legitimate for a human to own another. Without it, slavery is unenforceable. But in the gun debate, many people will assert that it's a God-given right. Now, I've read this book once or twice, and I've even skimmed through other translations of the same book. Guns and firearms are never mentioned. I am allowed to own people in these, though, so that's interesting. It's gonna be one of those videos, isn't it? But that's not the point. I'm not trying to bash religion or anything. Your right to own a gun comes from the government, not some supreme being or some inherent humanness, but the Constitution, specifically the Second Amendment. First, let's define our terms. In this case, the government can be best defined as an organization empowered to initiate force to enforce the laws it makes. An organization is just a group of people. Now with this in mind, that the government is just a group of people, let's look at rights. Rights can only exist in two ways, either negative or positive. Keeping in mind that positive and negative aren't commentaries on their moral merits. Positive rights just means you have an entitlement to something. Negative rights means there are things people cannot do to you. But these understandings of rights conflict. For example, a positive right to healthcare means you have an entitlement to the labor of the nurses, doctors, and the drug and machinery manufacturers, whereas they have a negative right to not be forced to associate with anyone for any reason. Both of these cannot be correct at the same time, so rights can only exist in either a positive or negative context. In regards to negative rights, the argument presented is that the right to have things not done to you only exists in as far as this group of people who call themselves government say they can't. In other words, according to the belief that government bestows rights in the absence of government, anything and everything is justified at all times including murder and theft. 
Huh. Justified murder and theft. Kind of like what the government already does through war and taxation. That's weird. If government bestowed positive rights, then nobody would ever be justified in taking anything without the government's permission. Which makes sense as these entitlements must necessarily come at the expense of somebody else. Problem is that theft suddenly becomes justified when the government says it's okay. Since the government has a monopoly on and are the sole arbiter of right and wrong, according to Knowing Better, the government can do no wrong, as they only need to give themselves the right to do whatever they wish and condemn their enemies as wrong, in which case democracy makes no sense, because opposing incumbents can never be justified. Now here's the funny thing about all this. If I try to take 40% of your income, you're justified in defending yourself. But if I call myself of government, suddenly I am justified in throwing you into a cage if you try to defend yourself. I mean, which is it? Either theft is okay, or it's not okay. It doesn't suddenly become ethical to steal if I call myself a government. Government is just a three-syllable word that doesn't bestow any supernatural properties to anyone, despite what its faithful adherents in the Church of Statism would say. I can't bestow rights onto my neighbor either. If I walked over to his house, and instead of trying to take 40% of his income, I tell him that I have given him the right to free speech, he'd probably give me this bewildered look before walking away. Now we must have rights. And they must be universal because otherwise nobody could possibly claim anyone is wrong for doing anything ever, as the question of theft, rape, or murder is as consequential as one's favorite lollipop flavor. In order for us to have rights, they must exist independent of our ability to understand them, and if we must have them bestowed upon us, then we don't have rights any more than our brother lends us their car, and that makes it ours. If that's the case, then who gave the group of people who call themselves the government the right to do so? I could go on and on on this topic. In fact, I probably already have, but putting it briefly, no. The government doesn't give us our right to own guns. I already explained where that right comes from. I won't repeat myself. It's self-ownership. And the Second Amendment guaranteed the right of the states to form those state militias. It was not an individual right to own guns. What part of shall not be infringed is so hard for people to understand? Which brings us to the first Supreme Court case that I want to talk about. Presser v. Illinois. Presser was part of a local workers militia not assembled by any government, and the state weirdly didn't allow that. The court's decision was that the Second Amendment did not apply to the individual except as part of a government militia for the good of the United States. I should have mentioned that if the group of people with the magic three syllables, government, can bestow rights, then they can take them away too. Can you even say you had those rights to begin with then? So basically, they kind of rewrote the amendment from this to this. Which wasn't that much of a change, we were now a united country after all. It's important to note that at this point the only practical firearms that existed were muzzle-loaded rifles, pistols, and shotguns. Lever action and repeating rifles were still fairly new, and the only machine gun in existence still needed to be carted around by a horse. Let me guess, the Second Amendment only applies to muskets? So as new weapons came out, the government had to figure out how to handle them. In 1934, the first real gun control law was passed, the National Firearms Act. This law mandated a special tax stamp and registry of all sorts of weapons, like machine guns, short-barreled rifles and shotguns, anything larger than a 50 caliber, explosives, and even poison gas. Things I hope we can all agree shouldn't be in the hands of civilians. There isn't anything special about people in magic uniforms that makes them more competent to handle these weapons than so-called civilians. Why shouldn't we get these weapons? If they're good enough for the violent, coercive monopoly, they're good enough for us. U.S. v. Miller Miller was in possession of a sawed-off shotgun and argued that the Second Amendment allowed him to do so. The Supreme Court disagreed, saying that it had no military utility. In fact, its only real purpose was to hide under your coat so that you could shoot people. They decided that the Second Amendment only applies to ordinary military equipment that could be used as part of a well-regulated militia. There's no military utility for a concealed weapon that shoots people? That's how the Church of Statism gets you. 
vague language that says whatever they say it means. I mean, it was the 30s, when totalitarianism was on the rise in the world. No, I'm going to jump ahead because he just goes on about history. There's the 1968 Gun Control Act, which required interstate gun sellers to have licenses because of reasons. There's the 1993 Brady Bill, which stops certain groups of people from owning guns because of reasons. Then, like a good little statist, he goes into the gun show loophole. But if I want to buy a gun from a private individual, say, at a gun show, no license, no background check. This is the gun show loophole, the thing that many people think should be closed. Including this guy, actually. I believe in background checks uh, at gun shows or anywhere to make sure that guns don't get in the hands of people that shouldn't have them. Oh wow, George Bush supported closing the gun show loophole. I guess I should as well, her. <laughs> Seriously, anyone who unironically argues the gun show loophole should be immediately disqualified from gun debate, as it's been so thoroughly debunked. Private individuals and gun shows must still comply with background check requirements. There is no loophole. Then he goes into the 1986 machine gun ban, which banned the sale of all automatic weapons manufactured after 1986. The eagle-eyed among you might have noticed the federal government's been doing an awful lot of infringing over the decades. Regulating who can use firearms, for what purpose, what types, who can sell, who can buy, and what you can buy. Then there's the assault weapons ban of 1994. So what is an assault weapon? I don't know. What is an assault weapon? Basically a weapon that has certain features that make it really scary, like a pistol grip, which makes the gun safer and easier to fire. A telescoping stock, which makes the gun safer and easier to fire. A flash suppressor, which m makes the gun safer and easier to fire. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the priests of statism who write these laws have no idea what they're doing. Again, being fully automatic means that when you pull and hold the trigger, it continuously fires multiple bullets until you let go of the trigger. That was a bump stock. Bump stocks. You're really hitting all of the statist anti-property talking points, aren't you? As of the recording of this video, bump stocks are still legal, but are in the process of becoming illegal. Unlike the grandfather clause of the machine gun ban, if they are made illegal, you would have to surrender or destroy any existing bump stocks. That's never going to happen. Here's a video of a guy making a bump stock out of a wooden stick, and a guy making a bump stock from just sticking his finger in the trigger a certain way. So no, the bump stock can't be banned, but your opposition has nothing to do with any principled stance. It's just because the bump stock is scary. Also, you're not going to stop people from 3D printing bump stocks, just saying. Now in 2008, Heller vs. DC affirmed the individual's right to keep weapons, finally. 2016 saw Saitano vs. Massachusetts, which allowed anyone to have a weapon regardless of military utility, unless it was otherwise banned. So that's where we are now. It doesn't really matter what the original intent of the Founding Fathers was. What matters is how it's interpreted today. What matters is property rights, which the government violates by its mere existence. There was no guaranteed individual right to own guns under the Founding Fathers. There is today. It's called property rights. There were no machine guns or even semi-automatics when the Founding Fathers were around. There are today. The Puckle Gun could fire at a rate of 9 rounds per minute, up to 3 times faster than the muskets of the day, as did the Ferguson Rifle, which were used by the British against Americans in 1777. The Knock Gun was essentially a rifle with six barrels attached that could fire in a volley. While these weapons were hugely primitive compared to modern weapons, to say that high rate of fire weapons didn't exist or weren't known about by the founders is hugely ignorant. Fun fact, the Second Amendment applied to cannons. And don't even talk to me about cities like Chicago. You accidentally walk across city limits all the time without even realizing it. You don't want to talk about Chicago because it proves how ineffective gun control is. California does have fairly strict gun control, but some people want to see it expanded nationally, or perhaps look something more like what Australia has. So let's clear up what Australia actually has. Yeah, let's not. Maybe I'll continue in a part two, but this is all I can take. 
So what's the takeaway? That the Founding Fathers can be reinterpreted however you want them to be? That certain weapons should be banned because they have really scary features? That our rights come from government? Now if you recall, he called himself a political moderate. There's no way to be moderate about property rights. There's no way to be moderate about freedom. You either have property rights or you don't. There's no middle ground to be found on the question of liberty versus tyranny and just picking and choosing what things you want the government to use violence to impose on people only betrays a lack of principles. I have no respect for moderates or centrists. It's a form of political virtue signaling to manipulate people into thinking your radically anti-property, anti-rights agenda is somehow the reasonable position. Not like those radical extremist radicals of the radical right-winged left-wingers. Look, it's simple. There's no moderate position on right and wrong. If you mix ice cream and cement, all you're gonna get is absolute garbage. Gun rights are property rights, and property rights are lizard rights. Uh, human rights too, I guess. Questions? Comments? Critique? What do you think about political moderates? Should I do a part two? Please say no. Support me through Patreon and Ko-Fi. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.